الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله Indeed all praise is due to Allah and as such we should praise him and seek his help and seek refuge in Allah from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds for whomsoever Allah has guided none can misguide and whomsoever Allah has allowed to go astray none can guide and i bear witness that there's no god worthy of worship but Allah who is alone and without partner and i bear witness that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the last messenger of allah in asdaq al hadith kitab allah indeed the most truthful form of speech is the book of allah wa khayra hadi hadi muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the best source of guidance is the guidance which was brought by muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam وَشَرَّ الْأُمُورِ مُحْدَثَاتُهَا And the worst of all affairs are innovations in religion. فَإِنَّ كُلَّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ وَكُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ وَكُلَّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ For indeed, every innovation in religion is a source of misguidance. And all misguidance leads ultimately to the hellfire. Brothers and sisters today I would like to begin a thought a thought which each and every one of us must reflect on perhaps the most important thought that we should have in our lives the thought which de- which determines the course of our lives whether our lives are successful or whether they are lives of failure the most important thought that any one of us can possibly have that thought is why were we created why were we created why did allah create us this question is a question which human beings ask themselves throughout the world why am i here for what purpose In most cases there are no answers. Most religions don't answer this question. Because they are man-made. And as human beings are incapable of determining by themselves the purpose of our presence here in this world, the purpose of our existence, then it's not surprising that they don't have any answers Islam has a very clear answer It is a clear answer which brought for me light in terms of my own personal existence having been a communist after having been born and raised a christian understanding the purpose for me gave me clarity the path of life for me became clear and i have never looked back since realizing that it is something which each and every muslim should know because 
It is clearly stated in the Quran. It is not something which Muslim philosophers have philosophized about. So you have different opinions. Some philosophers thought it was for this purpose and others thought it was for this reason or a variety of different ideas are out there. So unless you read the books of the philosophers, you really had no idea. It just remained a thing of confusion. No. It exists in the Quran itself where Allah states in no uncertain terms why we were created. However, on one occasion, when a Muslim brought, a Muslim from India, young man, he brought a Hindu to my office and he wanted, he had been giving some da'wah, had been explaining Islam to this Hindu young man and he felt that he was close to understanding Islam and needed some just further clarification. The first question I asked him was, why were we created? In your opinion, what do you understand being a Hindu? What is your purpose for being here? He looked at me and said, I don't know. I really, I don't know. Nobody ever told me. I said, well, you know, this is the difference between Islam and Hinduism and the other isms. That in Islam, that purpose is so well known that even children know it. And I turned to the brother who brought him and I said, isn't that so, brother? Tell him the purpose of creation. And the brother looked at me with this blank stare and I realized that I had made a mistake here. <laughs> Though it should be well known, since it is in the Quran, not every Muslim knows it. And that is really a very sad state of affairs. A very sad state of affairs. That we have them in our midst. <coughs> Muslim brothers and sisters who don't know why we were created. I won't ask for a show of hands. It was enough of an embarrassment for me in that occasion. So I don't want to embarrass anybody else here. I will assume that in fact there are amongst us those who really don't know why we were created. What is our purpose here? And I will quote for you the verse. For those who know it is a well-known verse. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah states clearly, I have not created the jinn or humankind except to worship me. Very clear. Allah mentions the jinn first because they were created before human beings were created. In case you were wondering. And he stated that their purpose, they were created to worship him. This is the essence of the purpose of our creation. To worship Allah. Having understood that, the question remains in the back of some people's minds and may be raised if you tell others that this is the purpose of our creation. 
Because when we create, we create a car, for example. We call it creation, but actually we have manipulated Allah's creation and made a car. Why did we create that car? To serve us. Right? To serve us. Did we have a need for that service? Yes. We created the car because we had a need. That car fulfills one of our needs. Ease of transportation. So we created it out of a need that we have. So the question is, why did Allah create us? To worship Him, does He have a need for our worship? Of course, this is the question that would be raised. And I've heard non-Muslims say, I'm not interested in worship any God who uh, has created me so that I have to worship Him. He could have created me for some other purpose. Because the idea of God creating creatures so that they will just bow down before him, you know, it is like pride. I'm not interested in worshipping a proud God. I've heard this is of course blasphemy. But this might come to somebody's mind. And so we need to understand it. Why did Allah create us to worship Him? Reality, as we said, Allah said, Laysa ka mithlihi shay. There is nothing similar to Him. So, if He created us out of a need for our worship, then he would be like us, creating a car out of need for its service. So we know that's the wrong answer. That's not the right answer. Allah did not create us out of a need that he had for our worship. So then what is the purpose? Why, the, why for worship? Why not for something else? Because of the fact that in worshipping God, in worshipping Allah, we become the best possible human beings that we can be. The worship is for our benefit. He created us as the Creator. That is one of his attributes that he creates. Not out of a need, but just out of the manifestation of his attributes of being the creator. Creation exists. But that purpose of worship was not for his need to have us worship him, but for our need to worship Him. Because in worshiping Allah, we become the complete and best of Allah's creation. As Allah said that He created us, we were created in the best form. But when we turn away from that worship, then we go to the lowest of the lows. He allows us to submit, to, to sink, and to become even lower than the creatures of the earth that he has created. As he described those who have rejected him, saying, Humkal an'am, 
Balhum Adal. They are like cattle. In fact, they are even worse. The cattle who just eat, drink, procreate, and die. That's life. Eat, drink, procreate. Procreate is a big word saying giving birth to children. Having offspring. Having offspring and dying. That's what the animals do. If that is the totality of our lives, then we are no better than the animals. And in fact, you have modern secular thought in the West is that, yeah, we are like animals. We are just animals who happen to be able to talk. Other animals don't talk the way we do. But there's no difference really between us and them. It's just our good luck that we happen to be walking upright and have more intelligence that we control everything. But really, we're like animals. And so when they study psychiatry and they study human behavior, they always look back at the animals. And they interpret human behavior based on what animals do. They don't have any problem with that because we are just animals who happen to speak. However, reality is that Allah has given us a status above the rest of creation. And this was clear when he created Adam and had the angels bow before him. This was a special status which Allah gave human beings. And because of that, he described the creation of Adam as being done with his own hands. And the blowing of the Spirit into Adam as being his blowing. Because of the special status that human beings have and are capable of achieving. So the essential purpose of our creation is ibadah, worship. But it must be understood as worship not in the ritual sense as understood in the religions of the world. You have a particular day, you go before your deity, your God, you do certain acts of worship, and you've done your worship. Then the rest of the time you do your own thing. You have a day dedicated for worshiping your gods, you do that. But the rest of the week, you do your own thing. That is not worship in Islam. The Friday Muslim is not a true Muslim. The Friday Muslim is not worshiping Allah. He is worshiping his own desires. As Allah said, have you seen the one who has taken his desires as his God? That's what a person who chooses to worship Allah only on Friday, he only comes to the masjid on Friday, he prays on Friday, he is not worshiping Allah. He is worshiping his own desires. Because Allah said that prayer for the believers is at fixed times, five times a day. At fixed times. Not all five in the night before going to sleep. At our own convenience. Worshiping some days and not other days. This is not the worship which Allah subhanahu wa ta prescribed. When he prescribed for us to worship him. His prescription of worship was according to the way that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, clarified for us. It is worship 24-7. 24-7? 
different from 9-11? 24-7 means 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, meaning all the time. No vacation. No vacation from worshipping Allah. And it is governed by the divine command Qul, say, Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahiyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. Indeed, my prayers, my sacrifices, my living and my dying are for Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. This is worship in Islam. Where a person seeks to do what is pleasing to Allah at all times. This is worship, true worship. Because what is pleasing to Allah is what is good. And what is displeasing to Allah is what is evil. No matter what benefits we see in what is displeasing to Allah, it is ultimately evil. It's evil, it's greater than it's good. And no matter what we see as being evil for us, if Allah has declared it to be good, then its good is greater than its evil. Its good is greater than its evil. This is worship of Allah. It is Islam, submission to the will of Allah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put Islam back into our hearts to give us the realization of our purpose here, to make our lives dedicated to his worship, and to seek to fulfill the requirements of worship in all aspects of our lives. O Allah, forgive our deficiencies, our negligence, our disobedience, and keep us on your straight path. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ I say that asking Allah to forgive myself and yourselves and calling on you to turn to Him, seeking His forgiveness, for indeed only He forgives sins. Alhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalam wa rasulillah. Having identified our purpose, I should point out that that purpose is translated in Arabic as Sharia. Sharia. Living the law of God. Living a life in obedience to the commandments of Allah. That is the implementation of the Sharia. And this is what forms the foundation of Muslim culture. Remember, before we spoke about the struggle which exists in the world today, how to put it into our context. What is going on? What is going on with the world? Why does the West have this attitude towards us? Because of Sharia. Because of our desire to make the law of Allah the law which governs our lives. The West has a different agenda. Their agenda is called secular democracy. This is the difference. What is secular democracy? Secular means take religion out of it. Religion has no place in the decision-making process of our lives. That's what secular means. What is democracy? 
democracy is our means, or it's the means of those who hold it, for deciding good and evil for our society. This is the machinery, the mechanism by which laws are decided. Democracy. So when we hear people saying we want democratic Islam or we want democracy instead of Islam, that's what it means. It's instead of Islam, instead of Sharia. Instead of Sharia. Because the two cannot coexist. We understand that is the essence of the cultural struggle that we face today in the world. As Muslims, we want to live lives in submission to the will of Allah. Meaning that Allah decides for us what is good and what is evil, and we run our lives in accordance with that. Globalization that we hear about is globalization of secularism. Remove religion from decisions. Why? Because religions are man-made. This is a civilization which has now rejected religion as a basis for truth, good and evil. Religion was for them what we call myth, folklore, human creation. There isn't really a God. So therefore, whatever religions we have, they're made up. And you can follow any one of them you want. It's your life. You can do with it as you please. But let us not make that the basis for determining right and wrong. What should then become the determining factor? Human decisions. We as human beings, there is nothing greater than us. We can decide for ourselves. And this is democracy. Democracy, you should understand just basically, it's based on three fundamental principles. Just to keep it simple, the first principle is referred to as equality. Now, the principle of equality, we don't have really any problem Islamically with. That principle recognizes that human beings are fundamentally equal. That they are endowed with the ability to reason, to think. Whether male or female, they're fundamentally equal. Of course, it may have other implications in Western civilization. But in Islamic civilization, Islamic culture, we recognize that basically human beings are all equally responsible to Allah. We're all equally responsible to Allah, whether male or female. We all have been required by Allah to do certain things, and we're equally responsible to fulfill them. Because everything which is required of us will be according to our ability. Now, in terms of abilities, of course, we're not equal. No two people are equal. Everybody is different. You have abilities in certain areas, weaknesses in other areas. We're all different. But in terms of our responsibility to worship Allah, we are equal. So there's no problem there. The second principle is called rational empiricism. Basically, what it's saying is that Human beings have the ability to learn from history and to determine for themselves what is best for themselves. That's why we don't need God to tell us. We have, as human beings, the ability. And when we get together, we apply the other principle, the third principle, called discussion and consent. We discuss what you have understood, what I've understood, what everybody has understood, and we can come to an agreement as to what is best. And we apply it. That's democracy. 
Democracy, which from a Western perspective is not restricted only to government, it has to do with all thought in society. It becomes the driving principle of Western civilization. Now, what's the problem with saying that human beings have the ability to rationalize, to reason, to understand, and to decide for themselves? Well, what that means in their context is that human beings know better than what has been written in the religious holy books of the various religions. Holy books, put them aside. We decide. So, as human beings, we don't need to depend on anyone beyond us. We can decide ourselves as to right and wrong. Well, isn't that true? Can't we decide personally what is right and wrong? Well, let's look at it this way. Human beings are a product of their environment. We are born same way as the Prophet ﷺ said, Kullu mauludin yuladu al fitra. Every child is born with a natural inclination to believe, to worship Allah, to submit to Allah. This is our nature. However, Abawahu yuhawidani, aw yumajisani, aw yunasirani. But his parents will turn him into a Christian, a Zoroastrian, or a Jew. It is the environment. The parents represent the environment that he's raised in. They will change that nature. So the person is a product of his environment. So when he sits down to decide what is right and wrong, he does so based on how he was raised. So you can't trust his reasoning. It is not foolproof. It's not to say that you can never find anything right. No, you can. But you can't trust yourself to find what is right every time. That's why Ali ibn Abi Talib had said, if the religion were based on reason and logic, human reason and logic, then we should wipe the bottom of our socks and not the top. But I saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wipe the top and not the bottom. So that puts us in the correct context. We follow revelation. Revelation decides. Just to give an example of how human beings can go astray with the best of intentions. In the Constitution of the United States of America, written in 1787, 1787, 600 plus years ago, or what was that 300 plus years ago? It states there, Article 1, Section 2, and you can still go to Washington and go and read it. Article 1, Section 2. It is called the Three Fifths Compromise. What was the Three Fifths Compromise? The Three-Fifths Compromise stated that black men, non-white Americans, black men, were to be counted as three-fifths of a white man. These were the enlightened minds of the 18th century who put together a constitution to govern America as it broke away from England. That's what they concluded. So it means most of us here would be considered three-fifths of Europeans, white men. And that is in the constitution till today. Of course, they canceled its operation. They don't use it anymore. They've amended it. 
But that is the origin. That is what human minds came to. Now those founding fathers who put this document together, there are many other good things in the documents about freedom and justice and equality and all these other things were there. Beautiful statements, wonderful statements. Islam would agree with many of them. However, at the same time they wrote this one. So we say, what happened here? What happened here? The reality is that those who wrote the document were raised in a society in which black people were slaves, who had no rights. They were bought and sold, like cattle. But they understood that they were something of human beings. But obviously not on the same level as white human beings. So for the purpose of voting, for the purpose of voting, if one man had ten slaves and another man had no slaves, or he had three slaves or four slaves, should the vote of the one with ten be equal to the one with three? No, they said no. We have to work out a formula by which those who are voting, they're not talking about the black people voting now. They're talking about white people who own black people voting. So if I have ten black slaves, equal to three-fifths, then they are equal to, or if we call, if we say, yeah, what's, what's the calculation of that? Uh, how many people? Six. They're equal to six white people. Ten black slaves are equal to six white people. So my vote as one white man is one white man plus six. So I'm counted as seven. Where there's the one who has only three, right? He was counted as one plus one. Or two. He's given two. He has himself plus two more additional votes. He's counted as three votes. So this was a formula. They call it the three-fifths compromise. We had to compromise on this issue here. Come to some agreement on it. Okay. So what do we say today? This is what? This is racism. Racism in its most ugly form. The ugliest of forms. Right there put together by the most enlightened minds of the 18th century there in the United States of America. So we say, were those minds capable of arriving at what was really good? No. It was relative good. Relative to them, white people, it was good. Relative to the black people, it wasn't good. So, that is why as Muslims, we don't trust people to decide. We let Allah, who has no interests, he has no influence. Nobody can influence them, say, well, okay, help us out. We are Egyptians, you know. Make the law on our side. No, no. We don't have that. Allah reveals what is right for human society as a whole, regardless of their color, their location, their size, their shape, their beauty, etc., regardless. The second principle of discussion and consent, what does this mean? It means that the majority rules. Whatever the majority agrees on, this is what is going to be good for us. And the discussion can only take place on the basis that nothing is sacred. Anything can be argued. The law which was made yesterday can be argued about today. The law which is made today can be argued and changed tomorrow. Meaning what? No stability. No stability. No stable moral principles. These principles are changeable from time to time. And this again is the difference. The Sharia, what Allah has revealed, there is no change. What Allah said was haram, is haram until the last day of this world. Human beings cannot get together and decide, no, it's not haram now. No. Times have changed. We're in a modern world. 
Our needs are different. No. What is haram remains haram until the last day of this world. That is the difference. But this doesn't mean that Muslims don't have any principle of mutual consultation, shura, which Allah speaks about. Amrum shura bainahum. Islam recognizes that rule of the society should be done with mutual consent of people of knowledge, not anybody because he has money or he has good looks or whatever, he becomes the decision maker. No. Those who have knowledge in the society, specialists, etc., you have a higher council that looks over the rulings, etc., and comes and advises the ruler, etc. This is recognized. Prophet Muhammad took shura from his companions, though he didn't need it. So there is that element there, but that is not the main uh, element for Islamic civilization. The main element for Islamic civilization is Sharia, what Allah has revealed. And we live in accordance with that. So any globalization principle, which means giving that up, that is the basis now of the clash of civilizations. India has accepted secular democracy. Hinduism doesn't have any system to rule the country anyway. The only other choice would be Islam. And of course they're not going to go there. Russia, China, they accepted secular democracy. That is communism. Communism is secular democracy. The only part of the world which has not accepted it in the core of the society is the Islamic world. Maybe our rulers, maybe some intellectuals, etc., have accepted it. But our scholars, our scholars, Muslim scholars who still hold a position of respect in the Muslim Ummah as the preservers and the protectors of the Sharia, they don't accept it. 100%. Because it is not possible to accept it, knowing the Sharia. So that means that the powers that be feel it is their duty to crush this Sharia and to replace it with democracy. However you do it, do it. And that is the essence of the struggle. So, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was blessed by Allah Taala to lead us to the Surat al-Mustaqeem, the straight path of the Sharia. And we are called upon to ask for Allah's peace and blessings upon him because of the guidance that he showed us. So I ask Allah SWT to make us instruments to bring back the Sharia in our lives. The Sharia which is Ibadah. To make a commitment to begin with ourselves, a commitment to change ourselves and our lives to ones in accordance with Allah's will. Accordance with Sharia and Ibadah. I ask Allah to give us success in this effort and that this effort would spread from amongst us to other parts of the Ummah and to bring the Ummah together for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah to bless the Muslim Ummah to find its way back to the path of Allah. I ask Allah to bless the Ummah to come to the aid of its brothers and sisters in Gaza, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Chechnya, in the various parts of the Muslim world that are bleeding today. I ask Allah to forgive our weakness and our uh, lack of ability 
to come to their aid as our brothers and sisters in Islam.